Today is February 16th, 2015. We are at Fort Benning, Georgia, the National Infantry, Infantry Museum in Columbus, Georgia. And we're here in connection with the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. Uh, my name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer with the Veterans History Project. Tony Hilliard is also here. He's also a volunteer. And Sue Verhoff, who is a senior archivist at the Atlanta History Center, is with us. And uh, Sue is the coordinator of the Veterans History Project in the greater Atlanta area and in the state of Georgia. Also today with us is, is Jordan Beck. Mr. Beck is the film multimedia production specialist at the National Infantry Museum, and we're grateful for his work in putting all this together for us. We're honored to have with us today Mr. Peter Sauer. Uh, Mr. Sauer is a veteran of both the United States Marine Corps and the United States Army. He's also the volunteer coordinator here at the National Infantry Museum. And Mr. Sauer, we really appreciate you agreeing to come in here today and talk to us about both your military experience and about your life in general. Would you give us your full name and your current address? Just We just need the city and the state. Uh, my name's Peter Andrew Sauer, and I live in Salem, Alabama. Okay. Where and when were you born? Uh, 31 August 1952 in Buffalo, New York. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Uh, for most of my life, I grew up in Tonawanda, New York. I came from a family of 11 children, pretty uh, uh, normal upbringing. Uh, my father was a pattern maker for Chevrolet and uh, not too much else to say about that. Okay. When did you enter the military? I entered the military in uh, June of 1970, right after graduating from high school. Okay. What were the circumstances? Were you drafted or did you join up? On I your volunteered. Own? I was uh, 17 years old and, uh, you know, in some ways impatient to get out of there, but uh, the reason I went in the Marine Corps and I, it was in uh, aviation was because my parents, with the Vietnam War going on, said, You're not going to. Uh, go in unless it's something that's not combat arms, yeah. uh, which is actually what I wanted. Yeah. But uh, they said, we're not going to sign for you. And being you know, young and impatient, I uh, you know, said, OK. <laughs> and, uh, so I decided to go in the Marine Corps and went into uh, aviation because they, uh, if you enlisted for four years, they, they, okay. uh, they gave you a uh, MOS in aviation. Okay. How did your parents feel about that uh, once it was all said and done and you were on your way in? Uh, at first they were really, um, you might say, opposed to the idea, uh, but they saw how insistent I was and that you know I was pretty stubborn and I wasn't going to give up. And uh, so they, you know, on both sides, I guess you could say, we both uh, decided this is the best we can get. Yeah. and. Uh, but once I did, they said that they were they were proud of the fact that I did, uh, you know, sign up to serve. And except for a brother who was in the uh, Army Reserves for a little bit, I was the only one in the family out of uh, okay. out of nine boys that uh, went in the military. Well, I'm sure they were proud of you in the long run that you did that. Uh, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, according to the information you know, you've given us, you went in in June 1970, and yes, that's sir. right sort of in the middle of the Vietnam War. Um, how did your friends react to that? Did they think you were doing a, the, the right thing, the wrong thing, or did they have um, any reaction? I would have to say most of them thought I was doing the wrong thing, you know, and it was uh, in a part of the country where a lot of people were opposed to the war. Um, yeah. And so there wasn't a lot of, uh, yeah. you might say, enthusiasm for yeah. it. Well, talk about your military experience. You went in in 1970. Talk about your training and where you went, any uh, experiences you'd like to share. Again, pretty pretty mundane. Um, you know, served in uh, you know went through uh, you know boot camp, 
uh, everybody in the Marine Corps at the time went through a month of infantry training and then aviation schooling and uh, uh, then to several different duty stations. And, Where did uh, you go to your basic training? Uh, Paris Island, Paris South Island. Carolina. And uh, that was a pretty tough deal, wasn't it? Uh, it was okay. I, 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 you know, not trying to be, you know, a bunch of bravado, but I didn't think it was too bad. Okay. Probably after twelve years of Catholic schools, what <laughs> the discipline wasn't a uh, a uh, a big surprise, yeah. you might say. And, yeah. And uh, you know, and it's just. I guess kids raised at that time, it it, it was, uh, you know, we were pretty durable, you might say, so. Yeah. Um, and then I went through the training, several uh, several different duty stations, uh, Cherry Point, North Carolina, Camp Pendleton, California. My last year went overseas. Uh, part of that was aboard LPH's helicopter carriers. We were uh, primarily on standby for evacuating Cambodia. Uh, so we were in Cambodian waters for a couple of months, but uh, that didn't occur until after I had uh, gotten out of the Marine Corps. So, so where were you when you went overseas and you had that assignment? Uh, first to Okinawa, and then they sent me aboard. They sent me aboard ship USS uh, Okinawa and USS Tripoli. Okay. And, and go into a little more detail about what your duties were, what you did. In, oh, I was in, uh, in aviation. I was a uh, a uh, DMOS is 6114. It's a UH-1 and AH-1 uh, mechanic. But I was a mechanic and later qualified as crew chief on Hueys. And uh, for a period, I was a search and rescue crewman in uh, Cherry Point, North Carolina. Okay. Probably one of the more interesting jobs I had. It was one of the more interesting. Yes, sir. T talk about that a little bit. Uh, well, because it was a search and rescue unit and. Uh, Every other duty day, every sixth day, you got to fly in the uh, co-pilot seat. So, of course, the, co the end of the pilot would try to uh, give you some stick time to train you as that. And uh, also another interesting thing about that, we had uh, two C-117s, which were pretty much World War II era aircraft, and two of the last enlisted pilots in the uh, U.S. military really? at that time, which was uh, yeah. quite, quite interesting also. Did they share their stories with you? Uh, no, Nothing. no, they were pretty. They were pretty private. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, did you fly missions overseas? Ah, uh, no, sir. I didn't. I didn't fly there. Um, you know, uh, there I was a uh, Cobra mechanic. Oh, okay. And uh, you know, so pretty much, I didn't do too much, uh, too much crew chief uh, time over there. Now, when you were <coughs> serving as a Cobra mechanic, were you on? Board at ship, or yes, were you sir. All, okay? Uh, for part of that, I was yes. Yeah. You ever run into situations where the Cobras came back in bad shape? Uh, uh, no, because we weren't we weren't flying any combat missions at that okay. time. It was it was actually after uh, uh, it was sometime I believe it was early in seventy three when the uh, Paris Peace Accord when they had pulled out ground combat forces, okay. uh, U.S. ground combat forces from Vietnam, but it was still considered to be in, you know, yeah. quote-unquote in Vietnam. <laughs> right, yeah. When that happened, Paris Peace Accords, what was sort of the attitude of your shipmates? Was there... Well, that happened before I went, you know, I, I went uh, aboard ship. Okay. And, uh, you know, so it was already... Uh, well, I don't know, I don't think too many people gave it much thought yeah. at the time, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, because we weren't actually there and kind right. of, uh, yeah. you might say in a way, insulated from that. And, uh, then while, you know, uh, waiting to evacuate uh, Phnom Penh was really what the, what the mission was. It was kind of, um, you know, if it happens, it happens yeah. type of thing. Where did you go from there to your next assignment? Just talk a little uh, bit after that, I I, uh, I ETSed out expiration time and service. Okay. And uh, I went back to uh, Tonawanda, New York, and uh, you know worked different jobs. You know uh -huh. for the most part there, but uh, the economy was pretty bad, and 
It was also difficult finding work at that time, too. Yeah. Uh, not just the economy, but there was really a lot of... Uh, uh, what's a delicate way to put it? A lot of... Uh, uh, reluctance to hire uh, veterans at that time. Oh, in, yeah. In fact, yes. uh, yeah. in fact, sometimes because of my DD-214, uh, because it had you know service in Vietnam, uh, sometimes looking for work, I faced outright hostility. Really? Oh, yes, sir. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I've heard other veterans had yeah. the same yeah. Uh, yeah. experience, and I was uh, standing in line one time in the unemployment line <laughs> talking to an Air Force veteran, and... Uh, and he was telling me his experiences were pretty much the same as mine yeah. uh, in looking for work. So, uh, short version, eventually, um, you know, I, uh, I decided to go back in the military, okay. you know, because uh, you might say enlisting when I was 17, uh, you might say it was where I grew up. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, kind of, uh, it was kind of like home, you might say, and it was... Uh, you know, a well, more welcome environment. And uh, probably the biggest reason that I came back, uh, that I came back and uh, went into the Army, not the Marines, because I went to the Marines, because I had wanted to be an infantryman. Okay. And I went to the Marines, and they said, no, we've got... Uh, and in 1975, there was a big uh, problem with recruitment. Uh, there was a force drawdown. There was the... Uh, uh, popularity of the military, you might say, at the time. And uh, there were a lot of prior service coming back into the military at that time, too. And uh, But I went to the uh, Marine Corps recruiter, and they were, and I asked them, uh, you know, hey, can I go in the infantry? They said, no, you're already trained in, uh, you know, in this aviation MOS, and we've got a shortage of that right now. And uh, I said, okay, thank you, and went down the hallway to talk to the Army recruiter, and I said, hey, I want to, you know, I want to go in the infantry, and they were like, with open arms, and says, brother, you know, come in, and uh, <laughs> so I ended up, uh, that's how I ended up in the Army as an infantryman, you know, and went through infantry training. Talk about the training you went through in the Army, and how that compared to what you went through when you first went into the Marines. Uh, in some ways, I thought it was. Uh, in some ways, I thought it was more difficult because uh, it was pretty. Uh, it was in Fort Polk, Louisiana, and it was. Uh, I would have to say it was pretty intense, pretty demanding mm -hmm. uh, training uh, to make it through there, and uh, but uh, made it through that. And <laughs> Fort Polk was pretty rough terrain, wasn't it? I mean, it was uh, like hot, uh, and, uh, depending hot, on the time. Swampy. Uh, I guess they put a lot of the. Uh, infantry training there in the Vietnam War because it probably was, yeah. you know, climate-wise and terrain-wise probably pretty close to, you know, to it. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah it was uh, pretty hot, pretty wet. <laughs> yeah. Talk about where you went after Fort Polk. A a after that, I went to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington for about two years, 9th Infantry Division, and... Uh, not too much to say about that, you know. Uh, and then after that, the uh, the army sent me overseas to a uh, a missile site in Italy, and uh, now that had to be a pretty interesting assignment. It was interesting, uh, quite quite a lot of. Uh, it's a lot of uh, a lot of long hours, a uh, lot of inspections, a lot of stress. Yeah. Um, but uh, now, what period of time was this? That, that was from uh, seventy-seven to eighty-one. Okay, and uh, and that's where I acquired the uh, the language uh, identifier because I learned Italian very quickly, um, and uh, you know took the uh, defense language uh, proficiency test and uh, passed that. And so from that point onward, for the rest of my career, I managed to keep up with my proficiency testing, and so I was a linguist in, uh, in Italian. Wait, did you just pick up Italian just on your own? By... Uh, pretty much having to use it because it was an Italian, okay. Uh, okay. Italian military uh, site. Okay. And uh, pretty much dealing with, uh, you know, 
Italian military and on the Italian con you know yeah. economy all the time. So, give us a little more detail about that assignment. I mean, what your responsibilities were, what, uh, what kind of threats were going security on. Security at, at, yeah. at that time, it was, uh, uh, it was, it was, uh, it's a physical security type job for. Um, mm, I don't know how much I can say about that yeah, because yeah. it was classified. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and I'm not sure now how, you know, uh, sensitive because there were right. certain things that uh, you could say and certain things yeah. that you couldn't say yeah. about what, what you were actually doing there. So, Did you I'm have different sure. levels of alert mm -hmm. status when something would happen? Oh, absolutely. Else in the absolutely. Okay. And, and the, biggest, the biggest threat was... Uh, that uh, that we face was uh, terrorism, even back in the seventies, and okay. uh, because then in Italy, especially the uh, the Italian Red Brigades, and in Germany the Bader Mannhof gang, and uh, yeah. uh, so that uh, what we were trained on, and that was uh, the biggest threat was from uh, was from terrorists. Okay. Did you get regular mm. intelligence briefings about what was going on with the terrorist groups oh, yes, and what yes, you, information yeah. they would receive? Huh. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and uh, you know, different sometimes different you know heightened uh, security awareness and yeah. things like that. And, yeah. You know, periodically bomb threats or uh, you know nothing that ever you know. You might say was a was a serious bomb threat, but yeah, yeah. Now I assume now where were you in Italy? Uh, it was outside of Verona, okay. in northern yeah. Italy. So I assume that you were able to get out and see a little bit of Italy. Oh yeah, there. absolutely, absolutely. Talk about what that experience was like oh, at your age uh, to be able to do that. Uh, well, like I said, we had you know really long hours there. Um, you know, just the nature of physical security, uh, uh, especially when you're short of staff, you might say. But uh, you know, for when when they did get, I love because I was living on the economy, had a, uh, a lot of Italian friends, some of whom I'm still in contact with, huh. and uh, you know, got to see a lot of the different sites. You know, uh, got to get up in in the uh, Tower of Pisa before they closed it off, yeah, and. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You know, for the public being able to go up in it, and they, uh, you know, got to see a lot of the, uh, yeah. the sites and everything else around Italy. Well, that so had to be a great experience at that. Oh, age. it was. It was a great experience. The uh, on on the economy and that. Yeah. And, uh, How long were you in Italy? Uh, actually, I I served two tours that oh, um, okay. in Italy. I came back to the United States after that, and I was in the Army Training Board for a year. Uh, and then uh, I was as a, I was a drill sergeant for two years, and after that, because I, I had a top secret clearance and I had the language qualifications, the army sent me back over to Italy, okay. and not to uh, not to an infantry unit. Uh, so I served another tour there from uh, eighty four to eighty seven when I came to Fort Benning. Now, on your second assignment, what were your responsibilities? Uh, it was pretty much the same, same thing. Okay. Pretty much the same thing, and by by, uh, I guess sheer coincidence, the same missile site that I had oh, been on the first okay. tour, which was uh, pretty amazing because there were only like 34, 30 or forty Americans stationed there, huh. and then, uh, you know, area pretty much isolated from other uh, yeah. U.S. Army units. So you knew your way around pretty well when you got back there. Since yeah, it wasn't there. a problem. I already <laughs> already spoke the lingo. So yeah, yeah. What other languages did you speak at the time other than English? Uh, Tagalog, yeah. uh, which is Filipino, and uh, I was qualified in that too. And I also managed to qualify in French and Spanish, uh, taking the Army's defense uh, proficiency tests wow. because I had had some Spanish and uh, French yeah. in high school, and you know. Study some of it on my own. So I was always fascinated with languages. Wow. You must be good at learning other languages to uh, master. Pretty much. Forward. I guess it all depends on how you pick your grandparents. So. <laughs> That's true. Where did you go after you left your second assignment in Italy? Uh, I came came to Fort Benning. That's how I ended up here. Okay. Um, and uh, I was here for about. Uh, I was here for about two years, and I was planning. You know, not you know 
to eventually retire. But uh, then when the, uh, the Gulf War started, or when Saddam, right before uh, Saddam Hussein invite, invaded Kuwait, I got orders for Fort Bragg. Uh, again, based on, because of the language qualifications. Yeah. You know, if you, uh, uh, I guess if you get put in special assignments for whatever reason, they, they pretty much got your, uh, got your tag for yeah. that kind of stuff. So they, uh, uh, they sent me to Fort Bragg to uh, Civil Affairs Battalion at the time. It was the only uh, active duty Civil Affairs Battalion at that time. It was part of uh, First uh, Special Operations Command. And uh, so not long after I got to Fort Bragg, they sent us over to Saudi Arabia uh, prior to the Gulf War. Oh. Well, talk about that experience. Uh, it was quite the experience. <laughs> uh, we were, uh, if I remember correctly, it was right before Thanksgiving of 1990 that they sent us over there. Uh, and so we were in, uh, we were in Saudi Arabia for... Uh, a couple of months before uh, before the uh, the ground war actually started, yeah. and uh, so we went in uh, about a day or two after it had actually started. But of course, everything was over so quickly. Um, you know, there's there uh, you might say a lot of the uh, functions that we expected we were going to perform they didn't they didn't occur because yeah. everything was done so quickly and yeah. the uh, and the Kuwaitis recovered so quickly but I spent a um, I spent a month in uh, about a month in uh, Kuwait okay uh, you know both during and after the war okay now how long were you in Saudi Arabia uh, so in Saudi Arabia, we were there, what, November, December, January, February. Yeah, it wasn't until towards the end of February that uh, okay. we went into Kuwait. Were you working with the Saudi military at all, or was it all, all with the American uh, military? No, it was, it was uh, you know, all with uh, U.S. forces okay. and, uh, while we were there. And, you know, it was pretty much, you know, Waiting to go in yeah. at that at that time. We were in uh, uh, we were in several areas for a little bit. We were uh, attached to the uh, J five and twenty fourth Infantry Division, and then they they moved our unit to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Well, we were in uh, we were in Riyadh and then uh, Dahran and uh, then eventually we went in. Okay. <laughs> Uh, talk about the rest of your the experiences tour there. over there. Your yeah. experiences. Uh, and... Yeah. Well, while we were in, in uh, I don't remember if it was also in, in Riyadh, but of course, you know that the the Iraqi missile uh, attacks on us. Yeah. And, uh, so you you were you were yeah we to we, those. we watched those uh, and uh, you know especially you know at at uh, most of them were at night if I remember correctly and you yeah. could. Uh, uh, either go to the, we would either, you know, look out the windows or sometimes go up on the roof and uh, uh, watch the, uh, you know, and uh, you could see the missiles coming in at night, you know, from the, uh, you know, from the exhaust of it. And uh, huh. I know one of them we were watching out the window and some of our guys were up on the roof watching it. And uh, you could see the Patriot missiles coming up and hitting the missiles. And one of them detonated not too far overhead. So they, uh, they stopped. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the guys came down off of the roof, kind of, you know, kind of looking uh, really, really, uh, you know, blood drained out of their faces, yeah. and uh, they stopped going on the roof to look at the missile attacks after that one. Smart move. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and then we went in there, and like I said, everything was over so quickly uh, that, uh, you know, and unexpectedly, but uh, I did get to see... Uh, just about everywhere in Kuwait City and in Kuwait for the time that we were there. You know, because for a while they had us looking for Iraqi stay-behinds and evidence of any chemical weapons. Um, and so we pretty much traveled the whole country, which of course is very small. But, yeah. uh, Tell us a little bit about your observations of the country. It, you know, <clears throat> we see it on the news, but 
if we haven't been there, what, what it was like, what the people were like? Or what well, you... what it was like, there weren't too many people because most, most of them had left. Okay. And the ones who did go behind, some of them, I, you know, I talked with some of them. Um, but uh, the, uh, the city, if you would look at it now, was probably nothing like it was then because it was... Uh, really kind of eerie because they uh not only was there destruction everywhere you know um destroyed vehicles um the uh you know and abandoned equipment and all that but the iraqis before they left they uh really made a uh a full attempt to da you know destroy as much as they could in yeah. the, in the city i mean just totally uh wanton destruction um for example, there were uh, at the uh, uh, the Kuwaitis had a uh, a race track, a horse race track. You know, they're very very big on horse racing. And uh, before they had left, the Iraqis had uh, taken all the horses and slaughtered all of them, Jeez. and they were just you know, wow. uh, you know, just all types of wanton destruction like that. Uh, you know, just trashing buildings, anything they could. Um, but they were, uh, you know, and they, they had also, uh, you know, and you listen to the stories of the, uh, you know, uh, the abuse, uh, which is putting it mildly of the, uh, you know, from, at the hands of the Iraqis from, uh, you know, from the people that still were in the cities yeah. and, uh, you know, what they had to put up with and, uh, huh. you know, that kind of, uh that kind of thing there and uh but uh they did uh uh they were they were not kind to any iraqis that they found yeah. uh that were left behind yeah. and uh from where we were staying you could hear the uh there was a uh, hospital uh not too far from us and you could hear the uh the gunfire from executions every night they were doing uh uh, they were trying and uh, executing Iraqis. They were staying behind, and you know yeah. the uh, the main police uh, uh, office in Kuwait. They had uh, you might say uh, rooms uh, full of Iraqis, and they were not uh, like I said. They were not uh, they were not too prone to uh, showing leniency to yeah. any Iraqis that uh, yeah. either either stayed behind, uh, you know, or uh, you know, as agents or who were, yeah. you know, left behind didn't, you might say, get uh, yeah. get with their units when they left because uh, that's one of the things that seems like it was um, over so quickly was because the Iraqis managed to, uh, well, once they, they got the word to uh, that they could withdraw, it was a headlong rush to get out of there. Uh, and that's why, you know, like the uh, now famous, the, the uh, highway of death leading outside of there, yeah. uh, where most of them got caught on the ground. And that was another scene of uh, unimaginable destruction yeah. there. Uh -huh. um, because it was like there was a ridge line, if I remember correctly, that uh, the road passes through. Uh, so it's like a choke point. And when that road was blocked, it was kind of like damming up a stream and the vehicles would go off to the side of the road. Oh. You know, they go off to the side of the road trying to, uh, you know, still trying to, to pass through to get north to Basra and Iraq. But uh, then the aircraft, uh, well, you could see, well, that's how you see, I'm sure, like you see the aerial photos because it was like a, uh, like I said, damming up a stream. They yeah. go off to the side, they get destroyed there. Yeah. It was blocked even further, so they would go yeah. you know, further than that. And it was just, uh, I guess, even uh, hundreds, if not thousands of vehicles of every, uh, um, every you know, wow. size, shape, because the Iraqi, uh, the Iraqi army had a mishmash of different armored vehicles that they'd you know, purchased from the Soviets and the Chinese mm -hmm. and even some older U.S. equipment from back in the 60s, yeah. French vehicles and all that. And plus, they, uh, uh, what they didn't destroy, they were trying to loot from uh, Kuwait. And, uh, you know, so there were civilian cars, buses, trucks, everything, yeah. every, every type of vehicle you can imagine. It was just like, yeah. uh, it's 
you know, the uh, when we when we went through there, the British uh, Royal Engineers were clearing it, but it was like driving through a uh, almost like driving through a huge uh, junkyard of Jeez. vehicles on either yeah. side, and uh, God. yeah, it's just a uh, incredible uh, destruction. And then you you add to that the oil well fires. <laughs> it's uh, oh yeah. Uh, when we when we first went in, uh, we didn't know what it was. You could hear this constant roaring sound in the background, and it was and it was dark. Uh, and it all depend, you know. And and we were there for a couple of days, and somebody said uh, uh, because it was like night from the uh, from the smoke from the yeah, oil well fires, yeah. but night like 24 hours a day sometimes as long as three days at a time and somebody one time who said you know when we'd been there about a day or two said hey you know we were in this other area and it's you know it's clear there's sunshine and all that <laughs> we were like yeah and they said yeah the the the, the oil well fire doesn't you know the clouds don't uh they yeah. don't extend everywhere yeah they're they're um you know it depended you know when we found out later it depended on which way the wind was yeah. blowing or you know, if there was no wind or not, but like I said, for for a lot of it, it was like uh, it was a, like night or almost nighttime conditions, Gosh. 24 hours a day, because the uh, the smoke was so dense, you could put on a, a clean uniform and just sit down outside, and uh, you would be filthy by uh, by noon because of the uh, the oil droplets. It was like uh, you know, it was like uh, you know, little tiny droplets of diesel fuel kind yeah. of constantly falling all over everything like Gee. the uh, windshield on a truck you'd have to constantly be uh cleaning that off because you couldn't even see from all the uh you know from the droplets from the oil well fires and wow. uh, did that affect your breathing at all uh i didn't feel it we had one uh we had one NCO in our unit who had had a uh, surgery, and he had uh, I don't know what for. He had one lung removed. We had a uh, he had to be uh, taken out of country because it was really affecting him yeah. badly. I, I guess it did because it got into everything. You know, yeah. you you were breathing it in. It you know got into your food, got <laughs> everything. Yeah. So it was uh, you know when when the uh, when the clouds were blown, were you know were were stuck over you. It was. Uh, I guess not the healthiest of conditions. Yeah. Well, c continue <clears throat> telling us about your experiences there, because that's a you know an eyewitness view that not yeah. many people hear that were right. Mm -hmm. You were right there in the middle of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I'd have to say. Well, like on the the highway of death, one thing I saw some people making comments on uh, on YouTube about it, about videos about it, saying, "Oh, they they slaughtered civilians. It was Iraqis just right." But that wasn't it at all. I mean, they they were uh, in Kuwait. Uh, they behaved like animals. Really? You could see from the results and from talking to Kuwaitis who were there. Um, and one of the things that I thought was the most um, and I don't know why, but uh, to me, one of the most disgusting things, uh, I had some Kuwaitis telling me that uh, during the occupation, the Iraqis had taken a, uh, a truck and mounted a uh, quad machine gun on the back of it, and they would just go driving around the streets at random times and just shooting at anything that moved. It was kind of like a, you know, almost like a video game for them. You know, so they said you could be out, uh, you know, like looking for food or uh, or water or, you know, medical supplies. And all of a sudden, you know, here comes this truck uh, careening around the corner and, you know, um, randomly open opening fire or not at uh, somebody. Good and, uh, gosh. Yeah. And, uh, but... Uh, yeah, their their behavior, and like I said, they they trash the country. Anything that they couldn't, uh, you know, that anything that they couldn't, uh, you know, that they couldn't loot, they tried to destroy. Yeah. So you know, and they like uh, you would see like office buildings where they'd break the windows and you know take all the files and dump them out all over the place and uh, burn things up. And uh, also, they were occupying homes, and it's interesting that. Uh, and Kuwaitis also told me that, you wait and you could see the, uh, uh, the effects of it, they, uh, when the bombing started, because of course the, the coalition started, uh, 
bombing campaign about 30 days before the ground war, and they said that any time that there were aircraft overhead, the Iraqi, the Iraqi soldiers would hide indoors somewhere. Um, but the Kuwaiti said that, that that was the time that they would go out and find food, and uh, you yeah. know the Kuwaiti underground would you know do what uh, whatever they could. Yeah. And uh, but uh, and interestingly, because they must have had a really haphazard supply system, uh, and some of the uh, abandoned bunkers, and they had bunkers all over the place, yeah. and uh, there would be big caches of food. In other places, they were starving. Huh. Like uh, one of our translators, uh, Kuwaiti translator, who had escaped when the Iraqis invaded, uh, one time he showed us his house. He, has, he was from a fairly well-to-do family. And uh, he showed us uh, in his house, and, and he said, oh, he said, uh, and there was a couple of piles of fur on the floor, and he said, the Iraqis, he said, they ate my dogs. Jeez. Uh, and they were eating dogs, camels, anything else in some areas, or they were, you know, pretty much starving. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, they, uh, when I was talking to the, uh, the one time we were talking to, uh, he was a, uh, I don't know if he was the police chief or one of the Kuwaiti police officers. There were three, uh, there were three, uh, young women driving around and we thought it was kind of strange whenever they saw Americans would be yelling saying oh we love you we love you you know Americans and that uh, but what it really was we uh, I forget what the reason was that we were stopping to talk to this Kuwaiti police chief and he had these three young women in there and he said oh he said these are uh, these are collaborators he said they're Palestinian collaborators because there were a lot of Palestinians living in uh, yeah. in Kuwait, yeah. you know, prior to the invasion. And he says uh, one of them, um, and he showed us the pictures. She said her her boyfriend was a you know big time collaborator, and he was in an Iraqi army uniform. And he said we know he's in country. He's looking for her. Uh, and we've put her, we've put all of them under house arrest, and he and he said we know he's coming back, and we'll we'll find him. Really? Wow. Yeah. And uh, wow. you know, because of course they, uh, you know, weren't weren't ready to uh, show a lot of mercy to him. Yeah. Uh, and probably not to them either. Yeah. But uh, it was uh, it was just kind of a strange situation. Yeah, it there, is. You know. The, the, uh, the whole experience, you know, with uh, with everything, because the uh, and it's interesting. The Iraqis, when they left, they just they just left, uh, and you can see from as many buildings as they fortified, and you know the the uh, supplies of ammunition and everything else they had. Um, if they had wanted to resist, they could have made us bleed heavily. Uh, so they but, had some resources there, if they. Oh had yeah, space. absolutely, absolutely. I mean, even in the buildings, they were, you know, taking uh, uh, cinder blocks and making, you know, like a lot of false walls and reinforcing walls, and making fortifications yeah. in the city. Uh, there were, you know, bunkers and fighting positions all over the place, not just in the city, but you know, in the yeah. uh, in the countryside, all over the place. They had just uh, tons yeah. of fortifications. Huh. Um, Tons of fortification, plenty of, uh, you know, plenty of ammunition in a lot of them. And, uh, you know, there was one, uh, uh, it was really kind of creepy. There was a, uh, a mosque that was no longer used in the middle of Kuwait City. And, of course, for, uh, because, of course, they probably knew that we wouldn't bomb a mosque. And this mosque, and you go inside, and it was just stacked. And it was a fairly large-sized building. Every room you went into was just piled almost to the ceiling with artillery rounds and different uh, different calibers, Gosh. artillery and mortar rounds. Uh, I mean, if that place went up, it would have left a big crater in the middle of the city, but it was just uh, rooms just crammed full of artillery yeah, rounds, grief. just stacked up pile on pile. Yeah, they that. just left it there? Oh, yeah, they just left that there. They abandoned uh, it. And a lot of them, when they surrendered, uh, you you would see like in... Uh, whole fields where units had surrendered and uh, just helmets all over the place and boots. For some reason, they, they a lot of them just uh, huh. took off their boots or 
you know, when they surrendered. Yeah. And uh, but they left behind uh, just all kinds of equipment uh, there. I mean, and uh, some of the stuff still in the packing crates. <laughs> Good I mean, gosh. they had uh, sure. they had tons of stuff, but they just, uh, just you know, for the most part, they uh, they left. Wow. Fortunately for us. For, yeah, very yeah. fortunate. So. Well, how hmm. long were you there, and then where did you go next after that? Uh, well, we came back to the States, and then uh, I was back to Fort Bragg. And uh, and while I was at Fort Bragg, um, we, we uh, uh, think about, well, we, well, no, we came back, and we were back for only a couple of weeks, and they sent us to northern Iraq for Operation Provide Comfort after oh. the... Uh, uh, the incident with the Kurds in northern Iraq, yeah. and so I was in northern Iraq for about a month. Uh, okay. t- after, t- tell after us the, about that. Uh, it was also pretty interesting there because uh, we were in an area of northern Iraq that, um, and this came as a surprise to me because you think of Iraq, you think, you know, originally you think all Arabic or whatever, and northern Iraq was actually quite... Uh, in a lot of ways, quite beautiful country. Uh, you know, you see these fields of wild flowers and yeah. all uh, are growing there, and uh, uh, mountainous area. And and uh, but then on the other hand, it was uh, you might say the uh, you know, the counterpoint to that was uh, there were all of these, and it was in a you know, it was a uh, predominantly Kurdish area, mm-hmm. not all. Um, in fact, the town we were in uh, had a had a large population of uh, Catholics, uh, Roman Catholic, and uh, they were ethnically Chaldeans, which I thought was, uh, you know, there were no more Chaldeans. In fact, uh, they also, a lot of them still spoke the old Chaldean language and attended a, uh, with the uh, captain who was uh, the other member of the team that I was in, we went and attended a mass really? in a Chaldean church. Uh, and there was con- Chaldean, it was done in Chaldean and, you know, Chaldean yeah. writing on the walls is very old Gosh. church, hundreds of years old. Wow. Um, but in that area, there were... Uh, there were all types of uh, towns that you look at your military map, you want a 50,000 map, and there are all of these uh, towns there that no longer exist because uh, several years earlier, you know, when they were fighting against Saddam Hussein, the uh, the Iraqi solution, in fact, not that long before then, in fact, I guess probably just a few months before that, uh, uh, Saddam Hussein's solution was to go in and wipe out the town. And when they destroyed these towns, they destroyed everything. Uh, they, uh, they killed everything and everybody. The cemeteries there were just, just, they were so packed that they buried people outside of the cemeteries. Uh, and they killed everybody, men, women, children. They demolished the houses. Uh, they even stripped all the uh, wire from the electrical uh, electrical poles, uh, blew up the water tanks, uh, you know, just complete destruction. Uh, and this one village, the only person left was a uh, an old woman, and people from surrounding villages would give her, uh, would bring her food, but there was uh, one woman, she had to be... I don't know, maybe in her 80s, and uh, she had lost her mind, but she was the only uh, person still living from that whole town that uh, that was still there. And uh, although some of the uh, Peshmerga fighters had been away, you know, working or whatever outside, when yeah. uh, you know, I met one who had uh, he wanted to go with us because it was uh, it was a really sad scene because he had uh, he wanted to see his house. Oh. And uh, you know he was a uh, he was a little guy. In another situation, you would think he was you know a little uh, little guy who might work behind a desk somewhere, yeah. right? But he was not one. He was a, a Peshmerga fighter uh, because uh, 
and told me he uh, and he went up there. There were tears in his eyes. He went to go look at his what was left of his house, and there was nothing, oh. nothing more than waist high left standing. But he had lost his entire family uh, to Saddam's forces. So uh, a lot of these guys who were fighting, they were kind of like they have uh, they have nothing to lose. Yeah, and uh, you know they were they were, you know, and you can see that now. I mean Peshmerga is told them it means he who faces death. And uh, that was certainly the case. Yeah. Uh, and we were attached first first two weeks to a Dutch uh, Marine uh, unit and then to British Royal Marines. But uh, uh, to give an idea of what these guys were were, were like, the uh, the Dutch commander the one time had uh, the company commander told the local Peshmerga leader to uh, and he was speaking to the translator told him he said, hey, our patrols have found. Uh, some booby traps at the cave entrances, and he said, "You know, he was of course very unhappy with that." Yeah. And he said, uh, "He said you're putting my soldiers in danger." And he said, uh, "He said, well, you know, we booby trap the caves. That's where we keep our weapons and ammunition." And uh, the Dutch commander uh, told him, "He said, uh, he said uh, so the translator says, tell them that we will confiscate their weapons if we find any more booby traps. And the Peshmerga leader just laughed. And he asked the translator, why is he laughing? And he said, because, he says, go ahead and take away our weapons. He said, we have caves full of weapons that you will never find. And so he said, go ahead and take them away. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, that... Uh, it was their territory. They, yeah. they 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 knew it well, and uh, <laughs> they were good fighters, weren't they? Still, uh, there, I guess. I I would imagine. Well, I mean, they're they're still there. Yeah. So I guess that's yeah. a testament to uh, to all of that. And and like I said, a lot of them had lost. Uh, they had lost everything. You know, not just uh, family and friends, but you know, whole villages. In these maps, you would see there were all of these. Uh, villages marked on the map but they they no longer they no longer existed there were no more people there were no more buildings there um, just maybe a little bit of rubble but that's about it wow no yeah so uh, i mean personally you know later for us going into iraq and uh, uh my personal opinion on that, you know, no matter what you might say about the reasons for going in, just to depose somebody like that, yeah. in my mind, is uh, yeah. is uh, all the justification yes. you need because both what he did uh, in Kuwait and to his own people is, uh, you know, totally inexcusable. Yeah. Just totally. You wish everybody knew the story you're just telling. Um. I think more of it needs to be said because there's no, you know, we live in such a, uh, you might say, a sterile culture. Yeah. But when you go over there and you see these these uh, uh, the scenes of the destruction, I mean, even look at the uh, hundreds of oil well fires that they start. I mean, yeah. that was just wanton destruction again. Yeah. They, you know, and we saw some of the. Uh, 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 demolition equipment that was that was left there uh because they would put a explosive and an incendiary device on the uh on the oil wells and the oil yeah. wells in kuwait have a lot of pressure uh yeah. that's one of the reasons it's so profitable for them because it's such high pressure yeah. and so if you blow the cap off of the oil well and you set it on fire it's like a blowtorch and that's why you would hear this constant like a like a roaring sound because uh it was from you know anywhere you came close to the uh, to the oil wells because it was just this uh, crude oil just just coming out under pressure and uh, and just constantly burning you know yeah. twenty four hours a day Jeez. and they just blew up uh, wow hundreds of those oil wells you know and the only you might say logical reason if there was one was because they know if they were losing Kuwait. And because of shortage, this would drive up the price of their oil yeah. by blowing off all of the other oil yeah. fields. But yeah. uh, still, when you look at that, it's like, oh, you might say in a civilized world, totally inexcusable. Yeah. 
Well, that had to have a lasting effect on anybody that saw that and saw the, the remnants of it. Uh, probably. I did, the, the best description I heard uh, later was they said there was a Marine told a journalist that he said, it's not hell, but you can see it from here. <laughs> and uh, it was probably a pretty close pretty good description, description of yeah. the way it the worked, you know, the... Uh, you know the smoke and the and the fires yeah. and the uh, uh, wow. and the noise and everything. Uh, talk about any other experiences you had while you were there, or, and then well, what you after, did after that. Well, uh, after after that, we we you know I went back to Fort Bragg, and then uh, afterwards I I ended up going to the uh, going to the Philippines for uh, uh, relief mission after the. Uh, Mount Pinatubo blew up. Oh. And uh And you had the language skills yes, sir. there. So talk, yeah. talk, what was that experience like? Uh well, uh helping with setup of setup of a uh camp for displaced persons who had been displaced by that because uh again I got to uh go in a helicopter to uh you might say get a get a uh look at it at the at the aftermath of that and again it's something unless you see it you can't really imagine it because the uh the ash from that is just so incredible you would fly over these uh, areas that that used to be jungle and uh only the treetops were sticking up above above uh, ash just ash must have been like you know Gee. 20, 30 foot, uh, 30 foot deep all over the place, and you know, in some of the areas close by, their roofs would collapse because, uh, you know, the ash accumulating it, you know, kind of like up north, of the, you know, with snow here, but yeah. uh, ash from the, uh, from that, and uh, you know, some place you could see, you know, uh, six, eight, ten foot of, uh, of ash from that, and so of course this displaced a lot of, uh, a lot of people who had. Uh, you know, been living in rural areas, and uh, uh, they basically had to resettle them somewhere, somewhere uh, wow. far enough away from there. But uh, and what you know. was your role and your responsibility while you were there? No, it was uh, what I had to do initially was to uh, go out. Um, I don't remember the name of the town, and go up and and. Uh, talked to one of the locals. There was a contact we had about using an area um, to set up a base camp for uh, U.S. military units that were uh, doing relief work there. We had uh, medical personnel that were coming in there. A uh, The Marine Corps supplied a unit of uh, for water that, uh, I think they specialize in water purification and uh, you know, sundry different yeah. units at the uh, uh, at the town at the base of the mountains. The actual the actual uh, resettlement area was uh, up in the up in a mountainous area. Uh, you know, along a winding road to get up there. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, we were we were there to uh, basically to do the coordination to, okay. and to accommodate the. Uh, uh, you know the setup of U.S. Uh, U.S. Yeah. units that were yeah. doing that. You know they had medical and dental units that, uh, yeah. and they would go up into there and and uh, do examinations on people. There was an Army engineer unit that set up a, uh, uh, you might say, a public bathroom for the people up there. You know for the sanitation facilities, right. that type of thing. You know basically just taking people and and yeah, you might say. Uh, Helping to set up and and you know resettle a, uh, a unit or a uh, a village. Right. What time period was this? Uh, this about? was in uh, this was in late ninety one. Okay. This was in late ninety one, and and after that I came back to the United States, and uh, then I retired. Okay. And I already had a house here before I had gone to Fort Bragg, so I came back to back to this area, and that's how, you know, I I ended up landing in the. Uh, Columbus, Georgia, Fort Benning area. Yeah. And, uh, well, I, 
We'd like to hear a little bit about what you've done since you've got out of the military. Uh, for most of that, I worked in uh, I worked for 15 years in uh, IT job, okay. basically as a program programming and as a manager, uh, but uh, not something for me. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, eventually retired from that, and uh, not too long after that, I ended up. Uh, getting a job here at the Infantry Museum. and uh, Now that has to be a labor of love for oh, you. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. They actually pay me to work here. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I really do enjoy working here. And I know you're involved, uh, well, you're in charge of the volunteers, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. And that's, that's a, it's quite an interesting job. It's like, you know, it's unlike any other type of management job what, that I've ever done. What makes it unique? Uh, it's unique because... Um, you have close to, uh, you have to maintain um, a sufficient volunteer staff to, to perform all the functions because volunteers that we have here, they, uh, you know, they greet visitors when they come in, they run the info desk, they uh, do tours of our World War II Company Street, they drive vehicles for special events and when okay. we have graduations. Uh, and. Uh, they perform quite a number of functions yeah. that uh, you know we could you know we couldn't do without them. But that said, a lot of them uh, may only work one, two, or at the most maybe three days a week. So, but the museum is open seven days or six days a week, yeah. and uh, so you have to take about a hundred people and manage oh. to have coverage for all of them and. Uh, and of course, they're working because they want to be here, not because they have to show up every day to, to collect a paycheck, yeah. right? And so you have to have enough people to cover everything. But that said, they, they are also the best bunch of people I've ever worked with really? because they're all here. Because again, it's all a labor of love for them. They're not collecting a paycheck. They're, yeah. they're here because, you know, uh, they want to be here. Yeah. They they uh, they want to provide that service to uh, you know to the army and the uh, and the community, and so it's uh, it's uh, really quite enjoyable working with those folks. It must require a lot of coordination on your part, leadership and coordination. Uh, coordination quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, when you've got about you know some people coming in only uh, you know for four hours yeah. once a week, it's it's. Uh, you know, and you have various areas that you have to put them in. It's, it's, you know, it gets to be a uh, challenge sometimes yeah. to, to, you might say, to keep the uh, keep the schedule filled. But, uh, it all seems to work out. Yeah. Are the volunteers predominantly former military? No, we have we have quite a mix. That's a, that's a that's a pretty common question. Uh, but no, we have, uh, of course, being you know the Columbus, Georgia area, being. Uh, a lot of military retirees, but we have uh, we do have a number of retirees, but in, and uh, a lot of uh, army wives. Uh, but we also have people who uh, are veterans only only served uh, uh, maybe you know maybe one tour with the military and not just army. We have navy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have some retired navy. We have uh, Air Force, uh, and we have some people who've never, you know, uh, never served in the military at all, yeah. and just live in the area. And and we have uh, just really a uh, a uh, interesting mix of yeah, uh, people with different backgrounds, and it's you know definitely not all military, although there are you know quite a number of them yeah. in there. Well, it must be satisfying to have a group where you know everybody wants to be doing what they're doing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's 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 one of the big uh, big benefits of working <laughs> in the job. But uh yeah, it's uh it's uh, pretty good. Like I said, it's uh uh probably of any job I've had the best group of people to be working with. Yeah. So, I uh, I feel like I belong here. Well, you I may be I may may not be uh 100% correct on that, but... Uh, <laughs> well, you're obviously doing a good job because you've got a full core of volunteers. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, we're constantly adding more, and sometimes some we had one who just, you might say, retired yeah. from it last week, and uh, sometimes people move away, different, you know, different yeah. reasons. They take on other commitments, and uh, it's, 
And it's also interesting to see, and one thing I didn't realize before working this job, is how many of the volunteers, um, they may be retired or semi-retired, or maybe not even retired at all, but they work uh, as volunteers in a lot of different areas, um, oh. in, like in different cultural centers, other museums, hospitals, hospice, I mean, in... in uh, uh, all kinds of different areas, yeah. and uh, you know, this is m might be just one of several places yeah. where the volunteer at. Good, and, uh, you know, it makes you realize how important volunteerism wow. is, uh, pretty much in any community. That's so true. Yeah, and it's uh, it's a good thing to see. It's, uh, yeah. It gives you a good feeling. <laughs> well, I want to do a couple of things before we finish. Uh, number one, I want to see if anybody else has any more questions. To ask of Mr. Sauer, Tony, Sue. Just a quick one about your grandparents. Uh -huh. you said you had two oh, grandparents. You take the, <laughs> yeah. on that. <laughs> uh, well, probably the language ability might come from my paternal grandfather. Uh, he was uh, he was German, of course, a name like Sauer, but uh, they happened to be living in what was then Austria-Hungary. So he was drafted in the Austro-Hungarian army and he served there, you know, just prior to World War I. But uh, probably due to that, he spoke German uh, and Hungarian. Uh, but when he came uh, to America, he, by the time he passed away, uh, I was only seven years old, but he had, uh, and everybody knew him, said you could not tell that he was an immigrant because uh, he Gosh. spoke English without a hint of an accent wow. at all. And, uh, you know, he, be, he became American. Yeah. He was American. Yeah, he was... Uh, uh, but my... Uh, well, my father and his siblings <coughs> also spoke German because my, my paternal grandmother never learned uh, English very well. She passed away, you know... Yeah fairly early so but they grew up in household uh, speaking uh, speaking German okay. so you know my father was was quite fluent in German <laughs> so did your grandparents ever talk about their experiences when they were growing up in their my grandfather uh, n he was he was really the only uh, grandparent I had much contact with yeah. and I was only seven when he yeah. passed away and he never really talked about uh, experiences uh, what he had then, yeah. and, uh, uh, some of what I know of him, you know, I dug out, you know, like from, uh, uh, you know, especially my one aunt, and uh, you know, some of the pictures that she found and she gave to yeah. me, like show, when, when he, especially my grandfather when he was in the Austro-Hungarian army, yeah. and, uh, and what he did there, and uh, yeah. trying to dig some of it out. But uh, no, my grandfather when he came here. Um, he became an American, yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, the good thing is your descendants can't say that because now you've told your story. <laughs> it's going to be on a, a DVD forever. Yeah, well, that's that's a good thing. Well, I try to, uh, uh, with my sons, I, you know, my, my, my parents and my grandparents never talk that much about their experiences and their childhoods, and, and I don't want, you know, I don't want my kids to grow up yeah. like that where they don't really know yes. who, who I really was. That's... And, uh, you know, that's why I, you know, I talk to my, my kids. I tell them about my experiences. And, that's uh, good. And, uh, you know, what it, what it was when I was growing up and, you know, stupid things I did as a kid, <laughs> and, you know. <laughs> well, and before we finish, tell us about your family. You said you've got children. Uh, yeah, right now I have, uh, I have two, two boys. Um, and uh, one of them is, lives in the Atlanta area now. He okay. graduated from high school. The other one is still in high okay. school. Good. And, uh, Good. Whether or not he's ever going to pursue a military career, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he's not really interested in that, but... <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to give you one more chance to just say anything you want to say, any message uh, you want to give to anybody that sees this or just fill in any blanks you feel like you left in, just anything else you want to say about anything. Um, well, actually, I would I would have to say that that um, 
you know, I have, I don't have any regrets at all about coming in the military or anything I did with that. You know, I got to, uh, in some situations, see history being made and uh, see a lot of things. And even if you didn't go in the military, I, I think that uh, every American should at least try to live in another country sometime yeah. or other and see what the rest of the world is like yeah. and you'll appreciate uh what we've got here uh, somebody went one time uh i don't know who said it that uh you know we may not uh we may not have a perfect system here but show me one that's better that's... and and in the travels and everywhere that i've seen i haven't seen it yet i agree with you 100 percent. i can't <laughs> think of a better way to finish this off you know, when we started, or before we started, you indicated you didn't really have much to say, you didn't have much mm. of a story. You, yeah. You've got a heck of a story. I guess once you got me going, I don't, I mean, know. I don't know how interesting it is. It is but. extremely <laughs> interesting. We've, we've done a lot of these interviews, yeah. but what you witnessed in Iraq and what you yeah. witnessed in Kuwait, I mean, the way you described it, uh, again, I wish everybody could hear this. It yeah. was just you know, remarkable to hear you talk about it. Uh, your experiences in Italy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you had a wide variety of experiences, and in particularly some of these cases, you really helped a lot of people. I mean, uh, thinking about those Kuwaitis and some of those yeah. people that were, I know you're modest. And you, I don't know, I just gonna, don't feel like I really did that much, you know. Well, I, I can guarantee you, you did, just yeah. based on hearing where you served and what mm -hmm. you did when you served. And uh, I mean, you're obviously a very academically oriented to pick up the languages the way you picked it up. I mean, that's mm -hmm. impressive enough, but... Yeah, um, you, you, How you pick your grandparents. <laughs> well, that's... <laughs> I got lucky on that one. That always helps. <laughs> yeah. But you, you really did have a remarkable military career and some of the experiences that mm -hmm. you had. Well, it, was, it was unusual. <laughs> yeah. And, it was uh, unusual. And then what you're doing now, I mean, mm -hmm. I can't think of many better things than what you're doing now with these volunteers and being able to share everything that we see around us here with the general well, the, public. The best thing is, is uh, to me, the high point is when you get uh, World War II vets coming in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because they have some, you know, and like I said, if you can get it out of them. Uh, some of them have some really fascinating stories. Yeah. And, and knowing that you're a veteran, of course, like I said, it yeah. makes it, yeah. uh, you know, easy to... Uh, for them to communicate yeah. with and uh, well a, a, a good example would be there was a uh, uh, there was a, a gold star mother her son had uh, he was a ranger and who he, he had been uh, you know he, he was a KIA aide in Afghanistan mm -hmm. and she came through the museum she had an escort and she was uh, they were asking about uh, a unit that her father had been in in uh, the 158th Infantry Regiment, I think it was in the Pacific in World War II. And uh, it's interesting, she said her father, uh, who was uh, a veteran of some really vicious fighting in the South Pacific in World War II, would never talk about his experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, but she said she he would never talk about it to anybody until her son, his grandson, was deployed to... Uh, I guess a couple of tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, and it was like then he would just totally opened up with with wow. his his grandson over that because it was uh, yeah. you might say a shared experience and he yeah. and he and he uh, she said that was the only person that he would ever talk with was uh, about his about his experiences in World War II. That's a that's a I wonderful thought, story there. Yeah, that I, that I, did do that. yeah, I thought that was too. And uh, you get a lot of. Uh, you get a lot of uh, interesting stories like that. Yeah. Uh, another one, I don't know, have you ever, in the Atlanta area, ever heard a gentleman named Henry Burnbray? I have heard that name. Yeah. Um, it was very interesting because it, it was, uh, I was working, it was Christmas Eve of 2013, okay? And, uh, you know, how I said we do the World War II street tours, okay? Well, I had a, a group, of, group of people came in and uh, we do them only during scheduled times and being Christmas Eve, it was, we were really shorthanded and they came in and they said, well, you know, 
uh, is there any way we could, you know, get to the World War II Street buildings? And I said, well, yeah, you know, I said, uh, we got a two o'clock tour today, but uh, I said, well, could we get in now? This was sometime late in the morning. I said, well, I don't really have anybody in this, and I wasn't too enthused. And he goes, well, my dad, he says, he says well, my father who's with us is a World War II veteran. And, uh, and I said, well, okay. Yeah, you know, you, 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 yeah. you, know, you hit me. You know, he hit the soft spot. It's a World War II vet. I said, okay. And uh, we went there. And I come to find out this guy, uh, and, and uh, he's got a bio online, but just absolutely, uh, you talk about an incredible story. He was 14 years old, Jewish, living in Nazi Germany. His parents were desperately trying to get him out of the country. They put in visas, to, student visas, to three different countries. Um, and he... Uh, he, the United States was the first one that came back, and so they got him out uh, to the United States. And uh, short version, he, he joined the U.S. Army when he was old enough, fought in World War II. Uh, he had some interesting stories about all that. And a lot of this I didn't find out until later when I looked online because it was his son who owns an architectural firm in uh, Atlanta. Uh, his family had gotten him out, and... and Basically, after the war, when he went looking for his family, they were the only ones who had survived. Yeah. Uh, was one first cousin on his father's side, one first cousin on his mother's side. Parents, grandparents, siblings, aunts, uncles, all. Wow. You know, and all the rest of the cousins, all, all dead. And, uh, but what's interesting about him, there is not a hint of sadness or anger or bitterness about the man at all. It's it's that's what I found the most what? amazing about wow. him, and he was and he talked really freely about his wartime experiences yeah. too, you know, and he does lectures around the Atlanta area, you know, to school groups and all that. But uh, what a great attitude to have! I yeah, I I thought that was you know, and it was and it just happened to be it was on Christmas Eve, and I thought that was one of the best Christmas gifts yeah. I had ever received in my life Boy. because it was just such a you know I get goosebumps talking about yeah. it now yeah. but uh, it, he was just such a, a uh, incredible individual you might yeah. say yeah it was quite amazing it was quite an amazing day there it must have been and yeah. you probably had a lot of those days dealing with the people that oh yeah, yeah. Here. But, well once again I just we want to thank you for coming in here and sharing your story I mean it was Extremely interesting to us. Oh, and well, thanks. I, I, I don't know why I didn't think it, so. <laughs> it was. It was to us. And again, thank you for doing that. And even more than that, thank, thank you for your service. Yeah. Thank you. It was nothing. <laughs>